of the forest fires. I don't know which cesium is. Do you know what an obituary is? Good. Compare the two. It works. The level of radiation in the air in the territory of Chernobyl's exclusion zone has exceeded its control limit as a result of the wildfires which continue to burn there. Ukraine's state nuclear regulatory and corporate inspectorate, excuse me, announced on Wednesday. What did I say about Russia? What did I say? What, why, why would they get rid of the Ukraine? They're fighting over it now even. Might it have been Chernobyl in part? Air sample taken on June 30th in the fire area near the abandoned settlement of Pelosky Pelosky contained a level of radioactive isotope C-137, one order of magnitude higher than the reference level established by the health and safety standard. What is that? This is why you tune into the correct views. I suck at math, by the way. The only way I got a degree was by simplifying it so that even an idiot like me could understand it. Okay, so I'm going to do the same for you because I'm assuming you're also said idiot. If not, just lie. We'll all believe you. Um, An order of magnitude, if there's a level 7 earthquake and there's a level 8 earthquake, you would think that on a scale of 1 to 10, the 8 is 10 times greater than the 7. That is not what order of magnitude means. Order of magnitude means that a 7.1 is equal to what you thought an 8 was. What I thought an 8 was. Again, this was taught to me. I didn't think it up. I'm not nearly as smart enough to do so. Christelle's going to use that against me forever. Um... A 7 to an 8 is 100 times worse. Every point 0.1 is 10 times, not point 0.1 or 1, depending on what you thought it was. No. So let me reread it now that you know the math. Contained a level of radioactive isotope cesium-137 one order of magnitude higher than the reference level established in the health and safety standard. And there's a link to it here at Prison Planet, if you doubt me. During the course of the radiological survey, which is undertaken regularly at 39 control points in the exclusion zone, staff at the Chernobyl Specialized Enterprise found no significant increase in the gamma exposure dose rate or beta particle flux density. In other words, what's all this means? A lot of big words, Sam. We know, we, we know, Sam, you know how to read big words. Is that all you got, Sam? Is that all you got for our Fukushima update? The Chernobyl fire is sending plumes into the sky that are going to do the same thing to the population now that it did to everyone in 1986. Guys, we got three stories left. I want to say real quick, because I got to give a shout out to my sponsors, and I have the best sponsors ever. Check this out. Now, if you like these stickers that I'm showing you on camera, I know Kyle likes to podcast these, so you won't see them because it's a podcast. If you're looking at this, am I the best artist of all time? Not really. I made these in Photoshop. The the uh, the font type is uh, standard, and I just went ahead and altered it. I did a little bit of work. I do have a degree in it, but you know what? I'm not the best artist ever. So I can get the job done. D Lake for Prez, StickerJunkie.com. Look them up. They may be the best printers of all time. Why? Because this sticker looks so damn good that you'd think I was the best artist of all time, and I'm not. Go to StickerJunkie.com. Let them know that you heard about it from the correct views, and you're going to be delighted. You're going to get stickers that you love, and you're going to get them at a good price. And You're going to get them at a better price if you mention that that you heard about it at the correct views. Put it in your order. Make sure David Lake sees it. This is spectrum.ieee.org, and uh, this stood out. I had to get to this because how many of you know, and I've covered it here a hundred times, regular listeners know, how many of you know that 
the radioactivity is actually so bad in Fukushima that it is melting down robots. The robots cannot, will not, do not, impossible. They can't work there. They melt down. Um, we cover it all the time here. We, the robots had just melted down. I'm going to go ahead and look this up when the last time I covered it was. The radioactivity was so bad that it shut the robots' ability to operate down. They were left in the middle of the area that they were told to survey for radiation. And they will never move again because the radioactivity is so high it doesn't just kill humans. It fried the robot. Uh, where is it? I know it's right here. Give me two seconds. It was covered as recently as uh, uh, 660. This is terror, friends. Listen to this. Another robot to enter Fukushima reactor, and we wish that it were modular. This is Evan Ackerman. First time he's ever been on the correct views. Welcome aboard, another new writer, or at least new to the show. The search is still on for the melted fuel that is hopefully, melted fuel by the way is called corium, sitting in a death puddle somewhere at the bottom of Fukushima's damaged nuclear reactors. After two snake robots designed by Hitachi, that's hardly a hack company, explored the Unit 1 reactor back in April with one of the robots getting stuck, the next expedition goes to Toshiba, and we did cover it in April. I promise you don't question me, because you're just going to find out that I did watch that one, too. They used a scorpion design that entered Unit 2 at the end of August. Uh, they're hoping for that. Hopefully it'll work, but the situation really needs a modular, reconfigured robot, and here's why. In order to get down into the shattered interior of the Unit 2 reactor, where an interior detonation is thought to have caused severe damage. There's a link to it, and we must have covered that about a hundred times here. The reactor caused a melt out. Now, you've heard of a meltdown. We all know what that is. Well, a melt through, and when it goes through the vessel, some of us know what that is. A melt out? I, I said we were going to get real today. I had no earthly idea what the hell a melt out was. As a matter of fact, you can ask Christelle, I never even mentioned a freaking melt out until I read about it because I, I wasn't smart enough to know what it was. Here's what it is. Here's my sticker junkie stickers, and they're in this reactor. Now i got to pick all these up. Sorry, Christelle. And then, whoosh, they blew up. Now, here's Fukushima, and it's got radiation, but everywhere that these stickers flew, wee. Now that area, it's got nuclear fuel in it too. It's going to give them cancer. It's going to give them heart disease. It's going to give them all the things we've talked about all show. Because it blew up like a dirty bomb sent from ISIS. Guess what? ISIS, guilty of many things, did not do this. So the robots must be fed through a narrow duct to even go over a gap between two platforms. To do that, the robot, by necessity, must be long and skinny, hence Hitachi's snake design. Toshiba's robot, another uh, major company who can't get this done because it's so bad, in corrobor collaboration with Japan's International Research Institute for Nuclear Decommissioning, is trying something slightly different with a liftable tail that it can bring around and over its body. So why does that matter? Because the robots are getting, literally, for lack of better words, infected with radiation and dying like humans do. This robot is 54 centimeters long and it's radiation hardened to be able to operate inside the reactor for at least 10 hours. Now there's nothing wrong with this design, but it seems clear that its adaptability is severely limited because of the constraints imposed by the entry point, again, needing to be snake-like, well, snake -like, and uh, Christelle loves snakes. Those tracks, for example, don't, like, don't look like they'd be very good at dealing with much of the way in terms of debris. That means if you finally snake through the hole, get your mind out of the gutter, if you finally snake through the hole and you find 
uh, debris in the way, well, you can't very well move it because you've been built like a snake. And there's debris all over from the explosion that I just threw all the stickers around the room telling you about. Those tracks, for example, don't look like they'd be very good at dealing with debris, but there's simply not enough room to make them significantly bigger or more robust. And although the robot has been radiation hardened, when an important component gets fried, and an important component will, trust me, get fried, it's done. It says, 13 years ago, Mark Yim, it's Ying Zhang, and David Duff wrote an article, and there's a link here to it, about the advantages of modular, reconfigurable, adaptable robots. Now, this is where all you Star Wars freaks start loving life. And I still got two stories left after this. Modular robotics has been hypothetically useful for decades. They wrote decades, a typo. But this right here is a real-world use case where modular robots could be invaluable. This is the moment where all of those, this robot could potentially be used in disaster areas, the realizations that you find in grant proposals. Give me money, I'm going to build you a robot that can do anything. At the ends of papers, well, that might actually pay off. A situation in which a robot can disassemble into pieces or adaptively reconfigure itself on the fly, that is, change its shape by getting rid of parts as needed, could be better and faster than any traditional design now. Plus, you've got an extraordinarily harsh environment where radiation will start causing your robot serious problems in just a matter of hours. In which case, having the ability to adapt how, it says here, by changing shape or behavior to deal with a damaged component, for example, could significantly extend the life of your robot. Getting rid of infected parts, like a robot shedding cancerous tumors, to use an analogy. It says, to be sure, there's an enormous amount of work that would have to be done for transition modular or adaptive robots to reach into the real world applications. However, at this point, it's unrealistic to make any sort of demand on a technology that's still active in development. But it would be great to have something to point to and say, see, you know all that crazy robot research? Well, it is important. And guess what? I love Star Wars. I love all that stuff. I've never been a real big robot person before now. We need robots, and we need them real bad. I've got viewers popping in right and left here. Friends, we got two more stories left. Leave me a comment or leave me something on Facebook. I don't know if I have anybody that's responded yet, but please do. We're gonna. You guys are listening. I'm going to go ahead and make sure I stay with you. Listen to this. Counterpunch.org. The Pope's Letter, Neoliberalism and Fukushima by Matteo Pimentel. Yeah. How many of you think that we have possibly the worst Pope now we've ever had? I mean, I really, really... This Pope is in favor of all kinds of terrible things. And I, I have to admit, I'm not real happy with it. I see it as... um. I see it as more of a problem dealing with him wanting a one world government, him wanting a lot of things that are de an ad absolute detriment, I'll say it, an absolute detriment to the betterment of mankind. And he's like fulfilling many of the problems that we have seen in Revelation. I don't like the man, but I found this to be really interesting. And again, I'm not Catholic, I'm Christian, I'm not Catholic. Japan's social disintegration. Japanese sociologist and Tokyo Metropolitan University professor Shinji Mayade argues that European nations progressed from the communal self-governance of food to the communal self-governance of energy after World War II. Mayade compares Europe's post-war developments with those of post-war Japan in his article entitled Pitfalls of the Nuclear Power Radiation Movement. His contention is simple. As opposed to Europe, Japan had actually accelerated its dependence on the market through trade liberalization and deregulation. Post-war economic indenture was exactly what the United States wanted from Japan. It goes on again. We did win the war. 
Moreover, the U.S. was able to procure Japanese market dependence through discussions of the trade liberalization of agricultural goods. It says later, of course, U.S.-Japan structural impediments initiative talks. Mayabe claims that the following effects of these U.S.-sponsored neoliberal adjustments would extract their toll on the Japanese communities in the 80s and 90s. And this is where it gets interesting, so don't zone out. Neoliberalism's adverse effects climaxed when in 1977, during the recession induced by the Asian currency crisis, washed over Japan. Miyade recalls the serious outcomes of a barely functioning Japanese economy, which then finally ceased to function at all. Among the consequences were, and let's get into this, Japan's heightened rate of suicide, which was four times the UK and twice the US, the scandal of the missing or long-dead elderly, ambiguous, ambiguous infant and child abuse or neglect, and the third of Japan's dead cremated without a funeral. Indeed, as Mayodi laments, well before the Great East Japan earthquake, Japanese society had already begun to disintegrate. Don't zone out, we're getting to the better part. Distorting Japan's financial policy after World War II, the U.S. meddled in Japan's foreign policy. Miyane offers the Kuril Islands dispute as evidence of this. The dispute actually begins with something Miyate labels as Japan's castration experience. This castration entails America's dropping of atomic bombs, Japan's U.S. written post-war constitution, and the Japan Treaty. In addition, the Kuril Islands dispute has its origins, of course, in the Yalta Treaty, yada, yada, yada. You all know this. Well, where does it, it get deep? Where does it get into what we talked about at the beginning of the article? Because I know that's what you want to know. Well, listen to this. The new Papa encyclical. Treatments of the Fukushima disaster might now come to include what the Pope Francis calls the new paradigms and forms of power derived from technology in his encyclical Lurnato C. Such powers contribute to the propagation of different forms of pollution whose effect are global. This includes all the eminence out of the Fukushima aftermath. Francis states, Technology, which linked to business interests, is presented as the only way of solving pollution problems. In fact, proves incapable of seeing a mysterious network of relationships between things and so sometimes solves one problem only to create another. In other words, the Pope seems to be acknowledging the massive problems that we are seeing here with all things nuclear. What am I getting at? I'm getting at where uh, Helen Caldicott and I quit agreeing. I'm getting to the dumbity of the day. I'm getting to the fact that man-made global warming is in fact a lie. And what they're doing is using the lie, which they want to fleece you for money for, much like our country's DUI laws, they want to fleece you for money for simply driving your car, for simply living your life. They want you to think that you're warming the planet through man's activity, and guess what? You're not. And what we're getting in its place is people believing that man is warming the planet when they're not. And okaying things like nuclear technology. Which brings us to the dumbdy of the day. Oh, yeah, we got the dumdy of the day, and you bet that we are going to go at it hook, line, and sinker here. Oh, this hurts to even talk about. Daily Caller. Listen to this headline. It says it all. Nobel Prize winning scientist says Obama is dead wrong on global warming. Another scientist that used to support Obama. Another scientist that used to believe in global warming has admitted that they're wrong. Now, throughout history, scientists often admit that they're wrong. However, global warming has become like a cult, as you will, re as you will hear in this Michael Bestash article. And it's something that regular scientists no longer wish to have their name tarnished with because it isn't happening. Oh, my God, i got to finish this by the end of the show. I had to stay sober to do the show. Ah, 
In 2008, Dr. Ivir Gayather joined 70 Nobel Science electorates, Nobel Prize, by the way, in endorsing Barack Obama for president. But seven years later, the Nobel Prize winner now stands against the president in global warming. I admit, I voted, I voted libertarian almost all of my life, but I can admit, I can admit past sins. I voted for Bush over Benarik, and I regret it every day of my life. I would say that basically global warming is a non-problem. Gayover, who won the Nobel for Physics in 73, the year I was born, told an audience at the Nindau Global Electorate meeting earlier this month. Again, and to protect myself here, Benarik is a whiny bitch. That's why I didn't like him. He's right, but I, I couldn't stand and listen to that whiny voice because nobody wants to hear a whine. Gayover ridiculed Obama for stating that no challenge poses a greater threat to future generations than climate change. The physicists call it a ridiculous statement, as do I, which is why Obama gets the dumb D of the day again. He's already got one dunce camp sent to him. And then Obama gets bad advice when it comes to global warming. I say this to Obama. Excuse me, Mr. President. You're wrong. Dead wrong, Gayover said. Gayover was a professor at Rennesailer Polytechnic Institute School of Engineering and School of Science. He received the Nobel Prize for Physics for his work on quantum tunneling. Many of you know that I believe that the uh, universe is a simulation. His work has led to that. Gayover said he was horrified about the science surrounding global warming when he conducted research on the subject in 2012. In other words, he realized he was wrong, just like I was for voting for Bush over that whiny-ass Bednarik. And yes, I still think he's a whiny-ass. Whine, whine, whine. I couldn't listen to that. Ironically, just four years earlier, he signed a letter with more than 70 other Nobel winners saying the country urgently needs a visionary leader and that Senator Barack Obama is such a leader and we urge you to join us in supporting him. Well, guess what? I don't think he stands by that now. By 2011, Gayver left the American Physical Society because it officially stated that the evidence is uncontrovertible. Global warming is occurring. The society also pushed for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Global warming really has become a new religion, Gaver said, because you cannot discuss it. It's not proper. It's like the Catholic Church, which we just covered. Gaver argued that there's been no global warming for the last 17 years or so, based on satellite records. Weather hasn't gotten more extreme. It might be where you are, but not globally. And the global temperature has only slightly risen, and that's based on data being fiddled with by scientists, he said. Again, this man won the Nobel Prize in physics. Can you say Einstein? When you have a theory, and the theory does not agree with the experiment, then you have to cut out the theory. You were wrong with the theory. Guess what, guys? He's staking his reputation. And he's being honest. He knows what he's talking about, guys. He's got a much bigger brain than I do. Thank you, friends, for listening to The Correct Views. Sam I.B. DeGange signing off. We have gone one hour and one minute. A very long massive Fukushima update. So do me a favor. Share it. I wanted to go downstairs and drink my rum. Guess what? I said it'd be done by the end of the show. Let me see that. I told you she was going to die. You didn't believe me. I told you she was going to die. You know what? She doesn't deserve to get cancer. Let's stop. Does. Let's stop Fukushima before it gets worse. Friends, thanks for listening. Thanks for putting up with my levity. I gave you humor, but I promise you, besides humor, I gave you facts. Good night, friends. I kept my promise. God bless.